Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Alexandra Gonzalez Beltran from the University of Oxford, and I'm going to talk about that that Lucila mentioned this morning, and it's the model underlying data mess uh, for data set discovery. Um, I will focus also mainly on the, so I'll give you an overview on how do we develop that. Uh, and focus more on dimension that it was interest uh, for this meeting. So, um, so for the name we chose uh, data tax suit because we uh, want to follow the same approach as, as PubMed to index literature that they require the just um, format. Uh, so we developed that for um, describing the data sets that uh, are going to be searched within the data med prototype. So all the information and all the developed, uh, development of that uh, is online. All happens in the open. So you can find the specification uh, with the different serializations, uh, validation code, examples, uh, schemas, and guidelines online in different um, Google documents, Google spreadsheets uh, that are accessible from our GitHub. Uh, page as well, and the BioCali Working Group 3 uh, on metadata standards, and the different versions of that have been uh, persisted in the Senodo system. Uh, and also you can read about data med and that in the two uh, preprint articles uh, that we have that have been accepted to nature, genetics, and scientific data uh, journals, but uh, the final versions we will have here uh, in the near future. Uh, we also have a set of a slides and documents that would help people to understand more about that. So now very briefly, I'll tell you about um, the different phases on development of that. Uh, that starts, started from designing and uh, developing the model, an initial stroman. So um, after a use cases workshop run by George Alter in March 2015, when the BioCali bio project started. Uh, so we took into account the use cases and put together a standard operation uh, procedure uh, that was uh, planning to look into the use cases plus existing metadata models uh, to develop a first version of that. Then uh, the working group three uh, was formed. It included many people, as Lucilla uh, uh, mentioned this morning, from many different institutions that commented and reviewed the Stroman, and this helped us to move it forward and evolve it. Uh, so on the top, you can see the different tasks that we uh, took, um, we carried out, and the different milestones. And here you can see the relationship with different working groups and external organizations that we wanted to take into account from the start. Um, so in December 2015, so the first version actually was uh, released on August 2015, in which we had the first specification plus a set of JSON schemas. That's the way we represent that uh, for implementation. Um, then we coined the name in December 2015. Uh, we, um, and at the same time, the working group seven, uh, led by George, uh, started to work on the accessibility metadata that we consider very important for that because it's about findability and accessibility of data sets that I'll show later. Um, so from then on, so in this first phase, we mainly focus on uh, engaging with metadata modelers. And from then on, um, also uh, looking into implementers of the model. So as you can see, then we released a, a couple of versions, a, a few versions of that up to March 2017 version 2.2, and each version included new features considering the feedback we received uh, from the community and from the core development team um, of, of data met. Once they were doing the ingestion uh, process, we found out things in the model that needed to be um, extended or corrected. Uh, and we are here today after two years of development uh, in this workshop in which we, yesterday we had a workshop in which uh, we focused on getting feedback on the model and, uh, in, and implementation. And today we're here to discuss more about the dimension part and the variable of the model. Throughout this development, we engaged with uh, many different communities, uh, many of the uh, BD2K uh, centers, um, 411, uh, because there were pilots 
um, for example, in data citation, so we took into account uh, their results. Uh, we are involved in W3C working groups, and we took into account best practices to put data on the web when developing that. Um, and as I'll show later, we engage with schema.org, um, and in particular, uh, there is uh, an initiative um, mainly run by Elixir, but open to everyone that is called Bioschema, that is looking at providing uh, guidelines on how to use the schema.org for biosciences. Uh, in that process, we also engage with Google, the Google developers of uh, schema.org, and we also, for example, take in, took into account data sites as a very important model for describing uh, data. Elixir is, a, um, as I mentioned before, is a, a project running in, in Europe about the infrastructure for bioinformatics, and you may have heard about the FAIR acronym uh, for findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reuse. So there is another project, GoFair, that is about implementing these principles uh, of fairness for data. So we also are engaged with that group. Okay, so um, the main focus of that is about finding, about this FAIR acronym, is the first two uh, letters, so finding and accessing the data. So when we developed, uh, we started out developing that, we focused we wanted to focus on the key metadata descriptions that allowed this uh, discoverability and accessibility of data sets. So that means that we uh, focus on the relationship between the data sets, the creators, the relationship to publications, the software that may have produced the data set, uh, the, and the, the specific biological interest as well, given that uh, for us the, the importance is to search uh, biomedical data sets and life science data sets. However, we point out that this is not a perfect model um, because we are not trying to represent all the experimental details. We think that this should be left for the original repositories and for findability, it, we focus on the main things that people would use to find uh, data sets. Um, so, and we aimed for maximum coverage of the use cases of those uh, if you look at the list of use cases we got, they are really, really broad. Uh, but at, at the same time, we want to keep a minimal number of um, data elements because we know it's difficult to get the metadata for different data sets. So for the process, as I said, there was uh, the use cases collected in many different ways, including a workshop uh, run at the beginning of the project. Uh, so we took those uh, use cases and identify the different elements that they provided and bin them in, in different categories. And then we also looked at the existing models used both um, <coughs> on the specific life science data repositories, so each of them have their own models and their own way of representing data sets, but also we look at generic models for data set description. Here is a list um, not necessarily comprehensive, but you can see more on the data specification of these two types of uh, schemas or models already used in other places. So again, we first try to see is there a model that would cover all the use cases and try not to reinvent the wheel, but we found that the generic models for data set descriptions like a schema uh, data site, VCS, uh, W3C had um, um, issued these guidelines for data set descriptions, which actually we were involved in producing as well, and have looked at different other models in the RDF world. Um, so all of these are generic for any data set. And then we also looked at more specific models uh, for life science repositories, like ISA, BioProject, BioSample, Minimil, that Susanna mentioned, and all the different standards that, and you can see that we also listed them in BioSharing that Susanna introduced before. So we look at all of, the, of these and we also map these um, schemas together to find the commonality and uh, help us define the different entities and properties that uh, are uh, good for uh, discovering data sets. So in the end, we converge in a set of elements um, between these, the competency questions of the use cases and the data models, and we came up 
we split them in what we think are the core entities, but core meaning that are generic and allow to discuss any data, uh, describe any data set in any domain. And then we have a set of extended elements that are more specific for descriptions of uh, biomedical and life science data sets. And when we defined it, we tried as much as possible to adopt uh, the elements defined in other models, like data sites. Okay, so for defining that, then we defined, as you would do in a CDE, actually, uh, the class or entity, their properties or attributes, and then the possible values um, uh, of uh, those properties. And as I said, we uh, split in between core and extended end elements. Um, one important thing is that while we call it core, as I said, it's because we, it's for describing a generic data set, uh, but it doesn't mean that the entities are mandatory. So we think that uh, this model has to be able to map to many different existing repositories. Um, each entity will be used if the original repository uh, has it. Otherwise, we don't really include it in, in the mapping. And equally, within each entity, only a few attributes we consider that must be present. Otherwise, we give uh, the flexibility of people mapping to include whatever they think uh, it's important to find data sets in, in a particular repository. So uh, another point is that we consider from the start that we wanted to be broad in what the data set uh, was, and we considered uh, databases that have uh, experimental metadata and data, but also we consider reference knowledge bases and see how we could represent that information. Um, and also, the data set, is, it doesn't live in isolation. It's important to link it to other entities that um, might be indexed in other repositories. So we do care a lot about linking externally to, uh, for example, data standards and software, given that there are already registries uh, of these elements, as well as uh, other entities like antibodies or or proteins that could be listed in other registries. Okay, so in terms of the implementation, we developed the model um, generically, giving definitions for each of the entities, and then uh, we define a set of JSON schemas, um, which we release uh, with every version. Uh, and another important point is that we decided to back to schema.org as a way of, uh, the, then the instances can be uh, JSON LD instances or RDS, that is uh, the same thing for people working on that. Um, so we have a set of uh, what are called context files in JSON LD, but basically it's a mapping between the data elements and a schema.org. Uh, during this process, actually, we noticed the schema.org data set description was lacking, so we've been interacting with the schema.org community in uh, looking at expanding uh, the gaps we found. Everything, again, is available online. We have uh, put issues in the schema.org tracker related to this, and the discussions are happening there, uh, as well as in meetings we, we have for the Bioschemas project, for example. Um, so why a schema.org is because we think this will give visibility from search changes to surface the data, and then people uh, can do more specific queries in data mesh and finally in the original repositories if necessary. Okay, so this is uh, an overview of the whole model. I'm not going to describe it in detail, but you can see uh, data set as the main entity links to uh, many other entities and how we describe the people that created the, uh, the data set, the organizations, the grants that are associated with it, etc. All things that uh, were required in the use cases for search. So all the core elements allow you to answer questions about the data set in terms of its provenance. So who, uh, what is the data set about? Who created the data set? Who funded the research? Who hosted the resources? So we have different entities covering all of that. How the data set was produced? Where can it be found? Uh, so, um, and how it can be accessed, etc. 
Okay, these are the 20 core elements, and as I said, none of them are mandatory, and I'll focus in a bit in the dimension part. As I said before, we also care that these entities might be described in other indexes, and as Susanna presented before, for example, via sharing the described standards, uh, so we could link to bio sharing if a data set relates to a, to a standard private bio sharing. Similarly, we could link to a CDE repository if the data set uh, is available, uh, if a use in a CDE available in a CDE um, repository. Okay, so about dimensions. Uh, we had a question this morning about why we call it that. <laughs> And we thought it was uh, because variable was a bit overloaded and we didn't want to uh, confuse. So we chose indeed a term that is more uh, data set oriented, we think, uh, in terms of data cubes and how uh, different dimensions are represented. Uh, and here we want to uh, report the different data points, their names, um, their nature, and their units in a data set. Here you can see the current, uh, so version 2.2, uh, set of attributes for dimensions that includes all different types of identifiers, so a primary identifier or related identifier um, of the dimension. Uh, we have the name that, by the way, this can be an annotation, so this could point to an ontology term. Um, the type uh, the that this is the type of variable, if it's categorical or not, for example. The data type, the, um, we can indicate if it is part of a data set. So here you can see a data set may have many dimensions, and a dimension may belong to different data sets. We indicate the unit that, again, can be annotated, like in CDEs. Um, and we can also indicate what it's about, and we can connect a, the dimension with a particular material. So, for example, the dimension is a BMI uh, and is about a patient. So, all of that can be represented. So, in a way, similarly to what Susanna described before, while um, the content standards in BioChain and the CDE kind of a split between what is content, what is the structure, and what is semantics, uh, here in this representation, we are putting all together uh, in a way. It's more in the in the linked data uh, way. Um, so I think that's it. So in terms of um, the idea, for example, this using dimensions could uh, list all measurement types performed in a clinical trial. But we were discussing yesterday that this representation is lacking in the sense of uh, not supporting relationships between dimensions themselves. Um, that could be part of, as we discussed yesterday, maybe we can even think of uh, other types of relationship between dimensions. So uh, we are really interested in the use cases discussed this morning and, and the outcome of this uh, meeting to see if we need to evolve uh, that. Uh, finally, an example of dimensions <coughs> that, again, you can find in our GitHub repository. Uh, and this comes from the mapping uh, of ICPSR model to that. So this is an example provided by, by Matthew and Sander from ICPSR, in which they represented a particular data set and one of its dimensions uh, in this way, with the identifier indicating the name that is uh, current marital status um, and uh, the different potential um, permissible values for that um, for that. Um, um, sorry, dimension. So, like uh, all of those there. And here you can see what data set is related to. Again, this data set is represented in the that way, not the JSON um, uh, file. And then here you can link to the landing page of describing that specific uh, dimension or variable. So, this is just to show how dimension can be used in practice. 